Hey everyone, happy Sunday. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about, or yeah, I was gonna say I'm gonna talk about what we're all gonna talk about, our classic film origin stories. So how we first discovered classic film for ourselves. For me, some, some of you may already know this about me, but I started watching old movies I want to say classic film, but I really, in my day-to-day -day life, I call them old movies. So I started watching old movies when I was a kid. And the reason for that being is, hey, Mark, good morning or good afternoon in your case, because I think you're, what, five hours ahead? We just moved forward an hour last night. So our daylight savings has been triggered. <laughs> So needless to say, I did not get a good night's sleep last night, but it's okay. We're here. Thank you for joining me as always. It's good to see you again. So yes, as I was saying, I started watching old movies when I was a kid, and that's mainly because I spent a lot of time. Hey, everyone. Hey, <laughs> sorry. I keep getting interrupted, but it's okay. That's that's what a live stream is. It's great to see you all here. So I spent a lot of time as a kid being babysat by both sets of my grandparents. So my maternal grandparents and my paternal grandparents. And this all started from my dad's youngest sister. So my aunt Grace. She, at the time, in the early to mid 80s, when I was five or six, my Aunt Grace still lived at home with my grandparents. Uh, my dad and his middle sister had already married and moved out by that time. So I was around six years old. And what that is 1988, 87, around there. And one day, I, again, I was at my grandparents' house because they were babysitting me. Both my parents at the time worked full-time jobs. So I spent a lot of time growing up with my grandparents. And my Aunt Grace happened to be home that day. And she said, hey, you want to see something cool? Okay. <laughs> and I mean, I still remember this. I mean, I don't remember it vividly because, again, I was only six years old. But I, I remember if I close my eyes and I and I try to remember back, I see snippets of this happening. And she said, hey, you want to see something cool? Yeah, sure. She sat me down, and she had a VHS copy of The Wizard of Oz. And you know what? I'm going to share with you guys what her copy looked like. Okay, so if you guys can see that, this is the exact VHS that my Aunt Grace had. So I believe this was the 50th anniversary VHS edition. So what it was is obviously it was one VHS tape, but then the front of the slipcover opened up and there was a book inside. So this, this was also, it was not only my introduction to classic film, it was also my introduction to special features, <laughs> which is awesome. I mean, we're so used to seeing now when you buy something from Indicator or Flickr Alley or Criterion or Eureka, we're used to seeing booklets and special features now. But back then in the 80s, this was the first VHS tape that I could remember having a booklet attached to it and a documentary film after the movie. So this was awesome. And let me just take a moment to look. Holy cow, so many of you are here. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to see everyone. My goodness, I hope you're all doing well and that you're enjoying your weekend and your Sunday. And I hope for those of you in North America, the time switch last night wasn't too rough on you. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, this is what my Aunt Grace sat me down and showed me that day. Again, I was six years old. And I remember sitting on the couch and not moving. <laughs> and that's very difficult for a young kid to do because, you know, kids get antsy, they get bored, they, they have to go to the bathroom or they want a snack. 
but I did not move for those two hours. And I remember after the movie was finished, again, because there was a documentary, I would say it's about 15, 20 minute documentary on this particular VHS copy. So not only did I watch the movie, but I stuck around after to watch the featurette at the end of the tape. And I, I've watched it so many times that I can recite the dialogue <laughs> to the documentary film. And essentially what it was, is it, it was a featurette that must have been made in the 1940s or 50s by MGM to promote maybe a re-release of The Wizard of Oz. So what it was is it showed you the behind the scenes of Oz, how they made the film. Uh, it gave a short studio tour with Ray Bolger. And I think it was uh, Jack Haley that were on like the MGM tram with fans of the film. And they, they were allowed to go behind the scenes and look at the sets. It was so freaking cool. So it was, it was a documentary film with new stuff that was recorded as well as uh, vintage newsreels of the time this film was made. And for the longest time, I thought as a kid that the land of Oz actually existed because I grew up watching not only this film, but that one featurette that showed how Oz was built, um, how it was filmed and the set. I thought it was an actual real live place <laughs> until my sister shattered that dream for me one day. And she's like, you realize that doesn't actually exist, right? They built it for the movie and then they probably destroyed it after. <laughs> and I remember her telling me that and me going, what? <laughs> Guys. Oh, anyway. So let me go back to the chat for a second. Hey, more people have joined. It's great to see you guys. So yeah, this was this was the first old movie that I had ever seen. Again, I was six years old and it's all down to my Aunt Grace, who herself, the, actually my dad's whole side of the family were, were classic film fans particularly of Elvis and the films that he made. Now, I know a lot of people now, they kind of ridicule Elvis's film career and, and most, I won't say all, but most of the films he made. A lot of people are like, oh my God, how can you watch that stuff? His films are garbage. But no, I mean, I grew up watching that stuff because again, my dad's side of the family were huge Elvis fans and they avidly watched and collected old movies. They loved them. They also, at the time in Canada, in the 1980s, on we only had maybe a handful of cable TV channels. And some of those channels during the early evening or later at night, they would show reruns of shows like The Three Stooges and Abbott and Costello. So I was very used to seeing black and white vintage stuff on a TV screen. I, To me, growing up, that was normal to sit down with my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, and even once my cousins came along, it, it was very uh, normal for us to sit down and watch these old black and white TV shows and films. So I'm thankful that I had that experience because I know a lot of people didn't. A lot of people, and perhaps even yourself, discovered classic film when they were a little older. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, uh, we are discovering new to us things every day. But for me, it just happened that because my family had already had a love for vintage TV and film, I was exposed to it very early on. So, I mean, I'm... I'm going to be 40 this spring. So this is over 30 years of my life have been watching uh, classic film. And it's it all started with The Wizard of Oz. And I'm sure the same could be said for a lot of classic film fans, because usually this is this is one of the first films you either hear of when people talk about old movies 
as well as being one of the first films that you actually sit down and watch. So let's go to the chat and catch up. Hey, Jeff, how are you? <laughs> so VHS, today's world, we're, we'll never know the pain of having to stop halfway through Gone with the Wind, Ben-Hur, Lawrence of Arabia, and swap out VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know, but that was, wasn't that part of the fun? <laughs> the worst, the worst for me was because I was such, um, I was a very particular child, uh, and I'm still like this now. The struggle with me with watching those double VHS tape films was when it, when it came time, when the first VHS tape was finished and you had to switch over to the second one, what I would do, because I was such a, a nerd about this stuff, is I would finish the first tape, but before I switched them over, I would have to rewind the first tape before I put it back in the case. And then once the first tape was rewound all the way, then and only then would I slip in the second tape. So I, there was like a five minute interval <laughs> between VHS tapes. And you know what? If, if I was still watching VHS now, I would probably still do the same thing where I would have to fully rewind the first tape before I moved on to the second one. Oh, I was a special child. <laughs> Eddie says, my introduction was also thanks to when I was babysat by my grandparents. Yeah, I remember watching Rio Bravo, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. That is my favorite Abbott and Costello film. Uh, King Kong and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That's awesome. Alex, hey, Alex. Honestly, we'll never forget seeing those winged monkeys for the first time as a kid. Oh, my. The, okay. <laughs> I think the reason why... So many of us have such a particular love and affection for The Wizard of Oz is not only because of the story, it's because of the visual impact it had on us. So that first switch from sepia toned to Technicolor when Dorothy lands in Oz and she exits her house into the land of Oz, that switch between... Um, sepia and technicolor first of all i my mind was blown because at the time i didn't know you could do that because when we used to watch black and white stuff on the tv it stayed black and white it rarely or if ever did it it switch like halfway or a quarter through the film. It just didn't do that. If you were watching black and white, you knew that it was going to be black and white until the end. But The Wizard of Oz just like threw that on its head. And I think that was a brilliant thing to have done um, it, on the studio's part and the director and the cin cinematographer. I think that was it's just brilliant. Brilliant. Hey, Tony, how are you? The Wizard of Oz is like a Christmas film for me. It used to be on, in my memory, every Christmas when I was a kid, and we always used to watch it. Got to see it on the big screen at the BFI, finally. Yeah, it, the, sa the same is very much true in North America. It's typically shown not only during Christmas, but any of the other big holidays. So Easter, Thanksgiving, it's shown at Halloween. So I, I think The Wizard of Oz is special in that it, it's it's certainly an event movie, but yeah, it, it just, there's no barrier. It's shown whenever, wherever, usually around a major holiday. Yeah. Mike, hey, good morning. I have a wonderful box set of The Wizard of Oz. It has all these great reproductions of vintage marketing materials, including a book on how to exploit the film. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I've had, the thing with me is, with The Wizard of Oz, because it holds such a special place in my life and in my heart, and because it kickstarted such an incredible passion for classic film for me, this is a film that I tend to want to own every single edition that comes out. So after my aunt having shown me her copy of the VHS tape, I then asked my parents, could you buy me this same copy? Because I want the book at the beginning. 
<laughs> could you buy me this same copy? And they did, thankfully. And ever since I got this copy in the 80s, I, I think I'm pretty sure I've owned every single new edition of it. So then uh, after VHS, obviously DVD came, then Blu-ray, and then all the special limited edition Blu-ray sets. I, I've had them all. Uh, I have it on digital. So this is definitely a film that I feel like I want to own and collect every single edition that's released. I think the only one I don't have is, is the 4K release that came out I want to say two or three, two years ago, maybe. I don't have that only because I don't have a 4K player. But if I did have a 4K player, I probably would have purchased that edition as well. And Jeff says, my intro to classic films was the first time I saw Maltese Falcon. Yeah, except this was when Ted decided to colorize classic films and broadcast on TBS cable. I Oh, how could you colorize a film noir? I mean, it, the color, like technicolor film noirs do exist. Um, a great example of that is Lever to Heaven, uh, starring Jean Tierney. It's Lever to Heaven, right? Where she, oh God, I don't want to spoil anything. Hang on, let, let me let me just Google it. <laughs> Lever to, yes, yeah. Leave Her to Heaven, starring Jean Tierney from 1945. That's a that's a great example of a film noir in color. But I, I can't imagine sitting down to watch a colorized version of Maltese Falcon. That's like colorizing the big sleep or the big heat or uh, out of the past. It's just no, no thanks. <laughs> but the first time I saw it, I was hooked. Hated that they changed it from black and white, but loved the film. Yeah, I agree. Tony says, when I was a kid, we had three channels, but they all used to show a lot of classic films. So they were a standard part of TV. I remember watching The Searchers with my nan who loved Westerns. Oh God, The Searchers? You know what? I got to tell you, I didn't come into Westerns until I was maybe in my late 20s, early 30s. I just didn't it's not that I didn't care for them prior to that. It's just that I wasn't interested in watching Westerns. I, I didn't think that I would like them. But The Searchers and Stagecoach were two of the first Westerns I ever watched. And my God, those films are beautiful, particularly The Searchers, where the, again, like The Wizard of Oz, the, the visual impact of that film is incredible. So that's a great one to see my goodness hey home videos i love your username <laughs> did you have columbia house in toronto that's how i got my first vhs tapes when i was a kid in bc we did i i remember always getting the columbia house catalogs and flyers in the mail and i mean those things used to come once or twice every week uh, and they weren't only for films they were for uh, i think cassette tapes vinyl records and i believe even books if i'm not mistaken or the books could have been by something some other publishing thing but i i think it was columbia house so yes we did have that but we never actually ordered anything in our house i wish we had but we never did mark says i'm gonna watch the special features from the wizard of oz on itunes after this you know what mark if you do can you tell me if, you know what, though, I should know this because I have Wizard of Oz on digital on iTunes. Um, I wonder if that same documentary film that was on this VHS tape, if that's still being released with the Wizard of Oz as a special feature, because I would love to see that again. I'm sure it's on YouTube. I'm sure you could look it up. But the first lines of the documentary film were... And I quote, hang on, many, many miles east of nowhere lies the enchanting land of Oz. And it, it just goes on. But God, that was a great, great documentary. And it was very short. Again, it was only like 15, 20 minutes. But God, I loved it. And I watching that, I actually thought the land of Oz was real. <laughs> I remember my parents getting tapes like Gandhi, South Pacific, and Lawrence of Arabia. 
I don't think I owned any of those on VHS. I know that I've owned Lawrence of Arabia on Blu-ray and digital, um, but I don't think I've ever owned South Pacific or Gandhi. I know we, we've definitely, we used to rent Gandhi a lot because that was one of my dad's favorite movies and we used to rent it all the time from Blockbuster. Let's see. Cameron says, my start was my dad saying I could stay up late and watch Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. That's how I met and fell in love with Katherine Hepburn. Yes, that's such a wonderful film. And it's so bittersweet knowing that Spencer Tracy um, unfortunately passed away. I think, what was it, a couple days after the last day of filming on that film? Yeah, that's a wonderful film. Thank you for bringing that up. My parents were out a lot, so we had babysitters who were very lax about what we were allowed to watch. So I saw Hammer films when I was probably a little too young. You know what, Tony, the same happened to me. Okay, so let me continue with my story. So The Wizard of Oz was the very first classic film that I had ever seen, and it was thanks to my Aunt Grace who showed it to me. So the second classic film that that same aunt showed me... <laughs> was Dracula from 1931 starring Bela Lugosi. So, I mean, it, words cannot describe <laughs> the impact that Dracula had on me as a six-year-old child. No, I was not horrifically terrified, but I was intrigued. And recently I watched, I'm going to share this with you guys. So give me a second. Let me share my screen. So I recently watched this Boris Karl. Oh, sorry. Boris Karloff, the man behind the monster. I watched this last week on shutter and it's a new documentary film came out last year. 14 minutes into this documentary, I was crying like a baby. <laughs> so you know what? If you guys have not seen this yet, if you are a fan of the Universal Monster series or a fan of horror or Boris Karloff himself or just a fan of classic film in general, please watch this documentary. I... There's something that was said in the film that really got to me. It hit hard. And that was, I don't even know how to describe it without, I don't want to spoil anything. Okay, so in this documentary film, one of the talking heads is Guillermo del Toro. And Many of you know who he is. He's a uh, film director and writer. When he was describing his first time watching Frankenstein, he described it as a religious experience and a revelation. When I was watching or when I was listening to him explain it that way, it hit hard because finally someone was able to verbalize the way that I felt about Dracula and then eventually Frankenstein when I watched that film as a child. I 100% say that watching those two films, uh, Dracula I saw first, and then Frankenstein I saw not next, but maybe a few films after Dracula. It was a total revelation for me as well, because Guys, I don't know. I, do, I don't even know how to explain it. It was just me sitting there and the first image of Bela Lugosi greeting Renfield coming down the stairs. I, I was transfixed. I was mesmerized as a six-year-old child. And that magic to this day holds. 
you know what dracula is not the best film ever made it's actually quite wooden and creaky in places especially the second half of it but to me watching that film was akin to having a religious experience and that's why when i was watching the boris karloff documentary and listening to del toro verbalize it that way it hit so hard that i started crying because i could relate to it a hundred percent i remember myself as a little kid sitting down and seeing bela lugosi for the first time as dracula and just being blown away to the point where I knew I was going to spend years of my life after that watching black and white film. I didn't care about anything else. I, 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 that's what I wanted to do for the next few years of my life, not even knowing at the time that this was going to be like a 30 plus year obsession. <laughs> But just the strength and the power behind that visual to me is remarkable. And I'm sure many of you had the same experience where you watched maybe not Dracula or Frankenstein, but you watched a film, a classic film that just took you, took you by like the heart, just ripped it out and said, this, this is what you are going to love for the rest of your life. So yeah <laughs> i don't even know if i made sense there but i'm i'm, I'm trying my best <laughs> so hammer hammer because at the time once i had watched dracula from 1931 i would i became obsessed with any dracula story and any dracula film and i think after dracula i watched Nosferatu for the first time, but that being a silent film, I didn't really connect to it that much as a kid. It wasn't until I was a lot older and I rewatched Nosferatu that I really understood it and really connected with it. But my mom came home one day. She she know she knew how much I loved Dracula. She came home one day with a new VHS tape that she had picked up while she was out shopping. And it said Horror of Dracula. And there was the count on the cover of the VHS, but it wasn't Bela Lugosi. So I was like, what is this? This is, this is not the Dracula that I love. <laughs> it was Christopher Lee. And when I say horror of Dracula, that was the North American title of Hammer's Dracula. I believe it came out when in 1958. So in the UK, it's known simply as Dracula, but in North America, it was horror of Dracula. So my mom came home with this VHS tape. She's like, oh, I, I saw that it was a Dracula movie. So I bought it for you. Watch it and, and let me know how it is. Holy, holy moly. <laughs> that then kicked off an obsession with Hammer films. I Prior to, to seeing Horror of Dracula, I didn't even know Hammer existed. I didn't know it was a studio because... I think up to that time, I had only really seen classic film that came out of Hollywood. I didn't know anything about uh, European film. I didn't know that Hammer was an actual studio. I, I had never seen Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing. So that Hammer of, Dra uh, Hammer of Dracula, Horror of Dracula was my introduction to not only British film, but Hammer in general. And then that kick started a whole nother obsession. <laughs> so I'm glad that you brought it up, Tony, because that film is incredible. So I remember, before I get into the chat, guys, I was in grade six. And I think when you're in grade six, you're what, like 10, 11 years old, 12 years old, around there. In, in our grade six classroom, there was a big bulletin board beside the classroom door. And every two weeks, our teacher would assign that bulletin board to one of the students in our class. And once that board was assigned to me, uh, first of all, the purpose of that board was to share a little bit about yourself. So to tell your classmates, more about yourself that they may not know already. So when it was my turn 
to curate that bulletin board for those two weeks, I brought in all kinds of stuff that were very special to me. And I put them up on the bulletin board and then I had to present to the class. Okay, this is this is my bulletin board all about me. And here's the stuff I brought in to show you guys. So it was it was essentially like a show and tell about yourself. <laughs> and I remember bringing in the my VHS copies of Dracula and Frankenstein from Universal. I, I, I didn't bring in the tapes themselves because on obviously you can't stick those to a bulletin board, but I, I brought in the slip covers and I remember stapling the slip covers to the bulletin board. And my teacher <laughs> was like, what, what is that? Why did you bring those in? And I said, because they're two of my favorite movies. And my classmates are all sitting there like, first of all, why do you like old movies? Ew, it's not even in color. Why are you watching that stuff? But then I explained to them, you know what, you guys, now it's cool in the 80s and the 90s, it's cool to go to the cinema and watch horror films. Like that was the whole big thing, like Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween and all that stuff. That was very popular back then. It still is now. But they're like, yeah, but what does that have to do with an old black and white movie? And I said, well, this is where it all started. So if we didn't have films like Dracula and Frankenstein and The Wolfman, The Invisible Man, all those films, you you wouldn't have the horror films that you have today in, I mean, you, you probably still would, but they're, they, they would probably look a lot different. So then once they heard that, they're like, oh, okay, so, so this is how it all started. Yes, this is how it all started. So yeah, that's just a cute little story about me being the little nerd <laughs> bringing in VHS copies of Dracula and Frankenstein in grade six to share with my classmates. Oh my God. Oh, I was such a special child. Okay. So going back, let's, let's take a look at the chat to see what, um, what some of you guys are saying. So Michael says the universal monsters were my gateway watching creature features every Saturday night growing up was a highlight of every week. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people could, could relate to that. The Stendhal syndrome says my first favorites were Hitchcock's Vertigo and the birds. Wow. I rented them from the library when I was really young and got to go to the Hitchcock Museum at Universal Studios, Florida, not long after. That is wicked. Wow. Does that does that museum still exist? I want to say probably not, but I mean, I don't know. I've never been. So, yeah, let me know if that place still exists, because that is awesome. What a way to start. <laughs> I remember almost forcing you to watch The Searchers. Yes, Jeff, I know. <laughs> because at the time, I was so reluctant to start watching Westerns. I honestly didn't think I would enjoy them. But Westerns are some of the most beautiful films that you will ever watch. And I I know that there's this whole thing going on with... Um, uh, what's, what's the Western that came out recently on Netflix? Power of the Dog with Benedict Cumberbatch. Did you guys hear about what Sam Elliott said about the film and then Jane Campion shooting back at him? Yeah, that whole thing is going on. I really want to see that film. Searchers peer pressure from the US. Yeah, totally. Was looking at the broadcast history of Wizard of Oz. CBS ran it the same day that Twister came out in 96. <laughs> well, there's a definite connection between the two. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank goodness they stopped colorizing classic film. That seems like a very late 80s, early 90s kind of concept. Um, even though I feel very strongly about not wanting to watch colorized versions myself, I can see where they do come in handy. In that, before you guys start giving me hate, hear me out. If you are wanting to introduce either a child or a tween or a young teenager to classic film, I think nowadays they would be more, um, more inclined 
to watch a colorized version of a classic film over a black and white one because kids nowadays are so used to seeing everything in vivid color, whether it's on TV or at the cinema or even on their tablets or mobile phones, everything's in color. So I think in a way, colorized versions of classic film make these movies much more tempting or much more attractive to a younger audience. So in if that's the case, if that's what it's going to take to introduce, let, let's say my young nephews or a young child that I know, if that's, if, if watching a colorized version is, is what it's going to take to encourage them to explore classic film, then so be it. I'm fine with that. It's not my preferred way of watching a film, but if it's going to help them discover classic films for themselves and want to dig into more and more after that, then okay. Like I accept it. Don't you just love South Pacific? I don't. <laughs> so Jeff is a really, really close friend of mine and we've known each other for years. I want to say almost like a decade or maybe even more. I'm not sure. But he knows how much I don't like South Pacific. <laughs> I've, I've watched it. I've tried to like it. I think it's it's just not for me. But I know that other people, that's that's one of their favorite musicals. And that's cool. I get that. Robert says, my dad was in the U.S. Army and we moved around a lot. My mom bought me a lot of VHS as a kid, and I can't remember a time when classic film wasn't part of my film diet. Lawrence of Arabia was a favorite. Yeah, Lawrence of Arabia is a special film for me and my dad because it's one of our favorites. And whenever it's on TCM, I try to watch it. Yes, goodness gracious, it is a very long film, but I try to watch at least some of it when it's on. And I know that I could be in one room watching it and the soundtrack to that film is so distinctive and so recognizable that my dad in another room will hear it and he'll come over to where I am. And he's like, oh, are you watching Lawrence? <laughs> and then he'll sit down with me and we'll watch it together. But that is a very special film and it means a lot to both me and my dad. Hey, Chuck. Chuck says, my introduction to classic film was through a film class I took in high school. Nice. I, we never had film classes in high school. We had drama, but not classes, uh, you know, specifically for film. The film that hooked me was The Big Sleep. Afterwards, I went out and bought it on VHS so I could watch it again. The Big Sleep used to be my favorite, favorite film noir. So if, if any of you haven't seen it, it is probably one of the most influential film noirs ever made. And it stars Humphrey, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, and a whole slew of character actors. And it's confusing as hell. <laughs> I know that I personally didn't understand the film until I actually read the book that the film is based loosely on. So the book helped me understand exactly what was going on in the film and all the different plots and storylines and how they connected without reading that book. I still, to this day would not understand the film completely. There's, there's certain aspects of the film that are like pretty, you know, you catch on pretty quick, but then others are, it seems so open-ended and certain plot lines aren't really resolved. And it just, oh. so the big sleep, um, used to be my favorite film noir until then I watched the big heat and that is is my favorite one to this day uh starring Glenn Ford and Gloria Graham and Lee Marvin but the big sleep is a fantastic one to watch but maybe read the book either before or after having seen the film and that'll clear up a lot of the plot lines <laughs> Just checked iTunes. The 1990 CBS special is on there. It does start with many, many miles east of nowhere. Okay, so that's that's the special feature that I remember watching over and over again as a kid. That's great that it's still on there. Awesome. The Spanish film Spirit of the Beehive is worth a watch in regards to this. Okay, I'll check that out. I've never heard of it, but I will check it out. Thank you. 
And he says, the invisible man did the same thing to me when he revealed himself to the hotel patrons. That The invisible man with Claude Rains, that is a wacky horror film. <laughs> it's so deranged, like r right from beginning to end. But my God, that is a classic. And you know what? It's I want to say that it's overlooked. I feel like it's overlooked a lot. I think when people bring up Universal Monsters, the first films they they think about are Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Wolfman. But I I rarely ever hear people talking about The Invisible Man, which is such a special film. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. The description of a religious experience might be because of the first affair or seduction into horror cinema. Yeah. That's probably what it was. I it was just transfixed to what I was seeing on screen. That yeah, for me, it, it was like a revelation of sorts. And he says, My introduction to Dracula was the TV movie starring Jack Palance. Oh my, you know what? I've never seen that. But Jack Palance, as a kid, he scared the shit out of me. I don't, I don't know what it was. I think it was because he played uh like a shady character in 1989's Batman. And that was probably the first film that I had seen him in. And then wasn't he in City Slickers? And he was in a film with Joan Crawford in the, oh gosh, what was it? The late 40s or 50s? I can't remember what it's called now. I think it's called Sudden Fear. He was like devastatingly horrifying in that film. Oh my God. But he was he was a great character actor. Don't get me wrong. He was amazing. Oh, what else? Let's see. Michael G says, my dad took me to see Hammer films at the drive in theater when I was growing up. Some of my some of my fondest memories for sure. Yeah. Hammer films hold a special place in my heart because, again, I, I watched I started my Hammer journey when I was just a kid. So those films mean a lot to me. <laughs> you are by far the coolest kid in that class. That was, I guess you're referring to me bringing in my, the slip covers of Dracula and Frankenstein and posting them on the bulletin board. Yeah, <laughs> I was definitely special. We had a show and tell session when I was eight. I brought in Dennis Gifford's book, A Pictorial History of Horror and Horrified My Teachers. <laughs> that sounds like something I would have done. Oh my God, we would have been best friends probably, Ian. Also, Ian, it's great to see you here. The first classic I've seen, I remember, was Manhunt of uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Yep, that's a good one, too. Power of the Dog is a great film. Yeah, I want to see that, Chris. I think maybe I'll watch it this week. I remember a cute girl from elementary school seeing me with a Leonard Maltin movie guide and asked me if it was my Bible. <laughs> Never felt so seen. Oh, that's awesome. That is wicked. <laughs> I used to have a few of those. I remember a new one used to come out. What was it? Every year or two. And then eventually he stopped making them. I think the last one came out maybe five or six years ago. But yeah, I used to have those too. And then I used to check off all the movies I had watched. The general was colorized on Amazon Prime when I watched it. Yeah, a few of my friends said the same thing where they found a free version to watch on Amazon. And there were multiple ones. I guess each one has maybe a different soundtrack to it. I'm not sure. But yeah, they said that they were all colorized, which which is a shame because you're not seeing it the same way uh, the audience of the period saw it. You're, you're not seeing it in its original black and white form. But again, maybe for children or a younger audience, maybe a colorized version of the film would appeal more to them and get them to actually watch it so again, I'm not entirely opposed to colorized versions, but for me, it's certainly not my preferred way to watch an old movie. The Hitchcock Museum was closed on January 3rd, 2003 and re was replaced by Shrek 4D. Oh my God, that's tragic. But 2003, that's, that's I mean, that's fairly recent. I'm surprised it lasted that long, to be honest. But yeah, I wish it was still around. That's a shame. Peter, hi Vanessa. Films happen right after the Saturday morning cartoons in New York City. A movie came on, usually Abbott and Costello, 
kung fu theater or some kind of monster movie. Yeah, monster movies were very, very popular here as well. And we're, we're fairly close to New York. We're in, I'm in Toronto. So we're only about an hour, an hour and a half away by air. So a lot of New York's programming was programming that we also got in Toronto. Yeah, horror was big. It still is. But on cable television, I remember there is horror used to be on constantly uh, on the weekends and then in the early evenings and late nights. That's horror was the thing. And I mean, I loved that. I, I can't say that I'm a massive fan of modern horror. I think for me, I'm a, a fan of horror from the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s. It kind of peters out after that. But to me, classic horror is my great love, not so much modern horror. Uh, modern horror to me is a, is a huge blind spot. Eli says, I watched the movie Hugo in which George, oh, I don't know how to say his last name, Malise is the main character. And from there, I became obsessed watching his films. After that, all the classic films were so captivating to me. Yeah, it only takes one. It only takes one film to kind of set off your journey uh, of discovering classic film after that. And I think that's so special. Ian says, you must watch The Spirit of the Beehive. Okay, I will write it down and I'll make a note. <laughs> um. Okay, so my next banner was, what's your story? And I've heard from you guys. Thank you so much. So now you guys know my story, how I was introduced to classic film, all thanks to mainly my Aunt Grace. Uh, first, she showed me The Wizard of Oz, then Dracula. And then from there, I just continued watching any old movie I could, no matter what it was. And it's funny because once I started with Dracula, then I became obsessed with vampires and any other edition of Dracula. So that kickstarted a whole side stream. Then I was fascinated by Hollywood musicals and I was obsessed with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And then after exploring their films, all I wanted to watch after that was Ginger Rogers films that she made in the 30s. And then that led to people like Ruby Keeler and Joan Blondell from the Warner Brothers pre-code musicals. It's just one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And here we are. It's 2022 and I'm still watching these films. <laughs> so Tony says, there were film series in the UK that allowed me to watch classic films. There was Movie Drome and there was a Channel 4 presentation of The Worst of Hollywood, which include Plan 9 from Outer Space. Oh yeah, Ed Wood. Gotta love him. <laughs> Michael says, if you haven't watched it, may I recommend the older? Oh, yes, dude, Michael, thank you. Guys, that is a fantastic film, The Old Dark House. Now, if you're in the UK or if you have a region-free player, may I recommend to you Eureka's Masters of Cinema edition of The Old Dark House? That, that is the greatest edition out there, in my opinion, of this film. It is, I, I will be totally honest and say the first time I saw that film a few years ago, I wasn't the biggest fan. I think because I went into it thinking that it was going to scare me or creep me out. And it didn't. It Well, I mean, it's a little bit creepy, but it, not as creepy as I thought it was going to be. But then as I rewatched it a second and third time, I really fell in love with it because the way that film is made, the characters in it, the wonderful, wonderful cast, uh, including Boris Karloff, Gloria Stewart, Charles Lawton, and oh my goodness, who was the other guy in it? Hang on, let me look it up. Guys, this film is incredible, so thank you for recommending it. So it is a film from 1932. Melvin Douglas, that's who I was thinking about. Great film. Thank you, Michael. The Old Dark House, Have a Potato. Yeah, so that's Have a Potato is one of the lines, one of the key lines from that film. So if you haven't seen it and you're wondering what Ian is talking about, that's that's part of the dialogue of that film. But please, my goodness, if you haven't seen that film, write it down, go watch it. 
And if you can, if you're able to pick up the Eureka edition of that film, it's fantastic. And the artwork on the slip cover is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I used to love monster movies too. Famous Monsters of Filmland was a great magazine for that kind of thing. Yeah, you know what? I remember growing up, there used to be a lot of niche magazines for classic horror that I, I don't see anymore. I don't know if it's because they've stopped publishing them altogether or if they're just not available in Canada anymore on our newsstands. But I really miss those magazines. Those were awesome. Then I became fan of Jean-Pierre Melville's movies, Le Sucre Rouge and Le Samurai. I've never seen them. So I will write those ones down as well. Thank you. I love getting recommendations from you guys. So keep them coming. Have some gin. <laughs> Robert Rawson's film, The Hustler, is the one that really got me hooked on classic cinema. It's still my favorite film of all time. That is a, a great movie. I remember I rewatched that after not having seen it for years, I think it was in 2020. And it, it's, it's funny because some people, I've heard some people say that when they've watched The Hustler, they were bored. Because to me, it's a very quiet film. It's not overly loud. It's not abrasive. It's not in your face. Uh, the Hustler has its quiet moments, but it's a powerful film. So yes, Mike, that's, that's a wonderful film. Artwork on old dark house DVD cover by Graham Humphreys. Check him out. Will do. I think I have the Kino release of old dark house, but if another release has different extras, I will get it. Peter check out, um, go to Eureka. Hang on. Let me see if I can pull it up for you guys. I hope it's still available because I know that the Eureka stuff, once it sells out, then it, it essentially goes out of print. Okay, hang on. Give me one second. The old dark house. Okay, yeah, it still is available. So I'm going to share my screen. So this is the edition I was talking about. It looks to me as if the slip covers have sold out. So as well as the artwork you're seeing here, there was a cardboard slip cover that went over the DVD or sorry, the Blu-ray case. And it was like a bluish purplish tint. The artwork on that thing was stunning. But yes, you can still purchase the Eureka Old Dark House um, from Masters of Cinema. You can still purchase that for 15 pounds. And yeah, here's all the special features, but be, be aware that anything you buy from Eureka is typically region locked to uh, region B. So unless you have a region free player, if you're in North America, you will not be able to play this disc. So just uh, make sure that your player is region free. Okay, let's see if there's any other comments before we wrap it up. I remember watching Freaks when I was young. It really scared me. It's on Classics. Classics, by the way, is a wonderful app. Uh, you can get it for free. And it has a lot of the public domain classic films on it. No, they're not the greatest prints. But it's still a very handy app to have because a lot of these films are somewhat hard to find online. So classics, I recommend it. I have it myself and I use it. Uh, but just be warned, don't expect like HD quality on here. The 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 prints are very muddy and blurry, but still it, it that doesn't take away from watching the film. And freaks, that was I I think I was maybe a teenager the first time I saw freaks. I didn't know what to think of it <laughs> at first, the first time I watched it. I was I remember thinking, what in God's name is this? Because it was so different from what I was used to seeing from old black and white movies. Freaks is just something entirely its own. But my goodness, you know what I would love? I would love for a boutique Blu-ray label to, to give Freaks a restoration and a new release because... 
I, I feel like not enough people know about it or if they've heard about it, they've never actually watched it. And I think it's a very important film, especially if you're a fan of horror and classic horror. I would love to see it get a brand new release. Oh God, can you imagine if Criterion re released Freaks? That, oh, that would be a must buy for me, like instant pre-order. <laughs> Speaking of Criterion, what did you guys pick up in the uh, in the flash sale? If anything, if you've picked anything up, let me know. I myself ordered. I said I wasn't going to order anything, but that that just flew out the window. <laughs> I ended up ordering four things. So I ordered Love Affair, which was a new release that came out in February. I ordered The Lady Eve because I wanted to replace my DVD copy. I pre-ordered Double Indemnity, which is coming out at the end of May. And I ordered the three silent film classics from Joseph von Sternberg, the box set. Because I've been wanting that box set for like two years now. And I finally bit the bullet and I bought that. Mike says, I'd really like to see the Criterion Collection release freaks. Yeah, I again, yeah, I just finished saying that. Mike, I think that would be awesome if they did that with a really nicely designed packaging, not just the typical uh, Blu-ray case, like maybe a digipack or something, like a nice box set of freaks would be awesome. The French's classic, which Raleigh impressed me, was... Oh, goodness. Okay, here's where my, my Canadian French is going to come in handy. <laughs> Les Desparaux de saint Aguille de Christian Jacques. I was 10. I, I, I think you want to say I was 10 years old, and I'm still impressed nowadays when I watch it. I Again, I will look that up. Never heard of it, but I will look it up. I only pre-order Double Indemnity. Actually, Tony, when I saw that you had posted on the Patreon face group page that you had pre-ordered this, that's when I pre-ordered mine. And I was like, oh, shit, I got to have it too. <laughs> but by that point, I had spent far too much money on other films. Yeah, it's a struggle, man. We're so lucky. I keep saying this again and again, but we are so spoiled and so fortunate to have all these great releases. Todd Browning directed Dracula and Freaks, which is what got me to watch Freaks for the first time. I think, yeah, you know what, Michael? It may have been the same for me because, because I, Dracula was one of my favorites. Perhaps I started looking into the director, Todd Browning, and then wanting to watch all the, the films he had made. And the same is true for James Whale, who directed Frankenstein. And uh, I, I believe he even did The Old Dark House. Is that correct or am I? Yeah, James Whale did The Old Dark House. I think then not only was I obsessive over actors and actresses, but also the directors. Once I discovered one film from a particular director, I, wanna, I wanted to see all the other films that that person had worked on. And the same goes for studios as well. So at one time I was only watching movies that came out of MGM. Then I moved on to, I think it was Warner Brothers then like Columbia, Paramount, RKO. Yeah, it's it's funny how our journeys just all branch off in different sections and different areas. It's awesome. Freaks does need a boutique treatment. Yeah, I went sci-fi at Criterion Solarius or Solaris. Is that how you say that? World on a Wire, Brazil, The Incredible Shrinking Men, and The Cat People. Cat People I had wanted to put up. I had put it in my cart, but then at the last minute, I'm like, no, man, I can't spend all this money. I'll save that one for next time. So Cat People is on my list for, for the next Splash sale. The Von Sternberg set is awesome. Yes, finally, I have it after two years. I think actually it's arriving today or it's scheduled to arrive today. So as soon as that comes, oh, that's it. That's what I'm doing for the rest of my Sunday. <laughs> it had gone out of print years ago. I bought it the day it was re-released on Blu-ray. Yeah, one of my friends uh, from Toronto, actually, she owned the DVD box set that originally came out from Criterion. And then she recently upgraded to the Blu-ray set as well. I picked up Double Indemnity, Midnight Cowboy, High Sierra is a fantastic film. Destry Rides Again, yes! Marlene Dietrich and James Stewart. Oh my goodness, that is such a good film. Awesome taste, Chris. And One Night in Miami, wicked. 
Tony says, which is why I may have accidentally bought the old dark house from Eureka, which I blame entirely on you. <laughs> it's okay. I'll take the blame, man. I'm proud of that. <laughs> Gods and Monsters with work is worth watching. Great performance by McKellen as Whale. Also, check out Mark Gatiss's biography of Whale if you can still get it. I will do. I've heard about that, actually. And I've been meaning to see if I can get my hands on it. Ringo says, not usually a classic span, but I watched To Be or Not To Be a couple years ago. Yeah, that's with uh, Jack Benny and Carol Lombard. I think that was that was the last film that Carol Lombard uh, was in, the last film that she worked on before her tragic, tragic death in, I believe it was uh, 1942. I could be wrong about that. Don't quote me on that, but I think it was 42. Now I'm more open to watching them. Well, that's great. You know what? It only takes one film. It, it, the same thing happened to me. It only took for me, The Wizard of Oz, to start an entire lifetime's obsession with something. So that's wonderful. I'm glad that you're discovering classic film now for yourself. That's wicked. I've got Cat People on Criterion, a really good Blu-ray. I remember you mentioning that to me, Mark. Yeah, I want to get that so bad. Next time, though, next time. So it is 1130. We've been chatting for an hour. I want to thank you guys again for, for tuning in and for watching and for actively chatting with myself and each other in the comments. Thank you so much. And I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Take care. Have a great Sunday. I'll see you guys soon. And catch me on Twitter. If you, if you want to chat after this, I am always on Twitter. My handle is at Vanessa Butino. And all the links of where you can find me are below in the description box. So thanks again. Have a wonderful Sunday. And I'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Bye.